Welcome to The Catholic Sphere. Each week we have a different host and a different focus as we tackle topics important to Catholics around the globe. I'm your host this week, Debbie Cowden. Today's episode is for parents. It's part two on how to discuss human sexuality with your children. And we respect your God-given right to have these conversations with your kids when it's age appropriate. So especially my, my young moms with young babies nearby, feel free to shuffle them out of the room, put in your earbuds, or come back and watch this episode and part one on our online streaming platform, EWTN On Demand. That's EWTN.com slash On Demand. And my guests today are experts in the field of chastity, human sexuality, and the church's teaching on life. Jason Everett of the Chastity Project, Mary Rice Hassan of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and Father Shannon Bouquet, President of Human Life International. So thank you all for joining me. Now, Jason, I wanna use the time that we have today to address some of the specific issues that parents are dealing with and, and seeing with their kids, the issues that are plaguing our culture, and, and most importantly, how we as parents should respond. So let's start with that. Um, now, we can't have conversations about gender, sexual attraction, sexual behaviors or sins or anything like that without first and most importantly recognizing that we're talking about human beings that are made in the image and likeness of God. And so in your decades of experience speaking to literally millions of young people about chastity, how have you seen the benefit of focusing on the dignity of the individual people that you speak to? Yeah, I think especially in terms of the, the concept of gender, human sexuality, I think a lot of times we look at it as simply an ideology that needs to be disproved without realizing that gender dysphoria is something that individuals are struggling with. And so sometimes we take a posture of dismissing it or disproving it, all this gender fluid, non-binary trans woman, that's just a bunch of nonsense. You're either XX or XY, all there is to it. But if you're a young person on the receiving end of that, you could feel just completely erased and visible and mocked, and so you tend to shut down. But what I find with these young people is what they really want isn't necessarily someone who has all the answers or thinks they do. They really want someone to walk with them and searching for those answers, someone who's actually going to listen to them. I remember speaking at a high school in New York and I told the kids, hey, if you guys need to hang out afterwards and talk, I'll be here to listen. I gave that invitation and the students formed a line seven hours long. And we were there till 5.30 at night and the kids would come up and say, I've never said this to anyone before, but, and then they would pour their hearts out about the addiction and the abuse and all the things that they were going through. And during these conversations, I found it's a really important one to, especially if you're a parent, thank them for coming to you. Hey, wow, thank you for opening up to me about that. I'm sure that was probably really hard and you were afraid that I was gonna maybe get mad at you and reject you and make you feel shameful and guilty, but tell me more about that. When did you start feeling this? You know, try to ask them those thought-provoking questions. I remember one young girl coming up to me and she said, well, I'm thinking of giving away my virginity. And you know, my first inclination is, okay, here's why not to. But instead of giving her the answers, I thought, no, I just gotta ask the right questions. So I said, why? Why do you wanna do that with that boy? And she said, I don't know. And I said, you can't say, I don't know. Why do you wanna give that gift to that boy? And she said, I, I wanna feel wanted. I said, that's a really good, honest answer. Do you think he wants you? And she's like, yeah, I know he wants me. I'm like, no, do you think he wants you? And she thought about it and she said, no. I go, what do you think he wants? She said, he just wants sex. I said, is that all you want? And she's like, oh, no, I'm gonna break up with him tomorrow. I'm gonna send him a text message right now. And I'm like, you go girl. I didn't tell her what to do. I asked her the right questions and she owned it. And so in these difficult questions, instead of trying to scramble for the perfect answer for your kid, try to get into the posture of asking them the right question. Amen. And as you saw, they, they were able to come up with the answer on their own. They knew what the truth was deep down in their hearts and mm -hmm. praise God for your witness and for your gentleness and for treating her as a person. Uh, and, and we as parents can have that same power with our children as well. And now Mary, I want to encourage our viewers to watch the series that you hosted on EWTN called The Transgender Movement, What Catholics Need to Know, which they can view at EWTN.com slash Hassan. And now we, obviously won't be able to recap everything from the series, but I do wanna call attention to the fact that while yes, we are talking about the human person and the unique personal struggles that individuals face with their gender identity, but there are also nefarious agendas out there that are deliberately leading souls away from the truth. So 
as parents, we need to actively protect our children from these negative influences. And I know it's a big question, but Mary, how do we do that? Yeah, I think first you have to recognize that the premise has shifted within psychology, medicine, education, the culture at large. And, and what I mean by that is the premise about the human person. So the premise that is being accepted and being pushed on our kids is that feelings define reality and that who you are is something you have to self-determine. And therefore, that if your feelings, if you're distressed about your body or unsure about your identity, if your feelings don't match the reality of being created male or female, you get to decide to do, do it your way. And, and that's, it's just not true, but it's a radically different premise because even psychology until the early 60s looked at an issue or a situation where a person's feelings were not matching reality in terms of, of identity. And they said, look, this is a disorder. There's, there's something underneath this. We have to figure out how to help this person. Uh, but with that paradigm shift, what we have seen instead is that our kids are, are being propagandized. And so I, I want to highlight three different channels that really are coming at our kids. They are being influenced by social media, by education, and by healthcare. Social media is, is sort of obvious, but I think parents are perhaps intimidated and not willing to make hard decisions. And so just think about it this way. Your kids, the average kid, 97% of them are on their smartphones, spending six to eight hours a day. And what's coming at them is content that is not something they even have to search for. The algorithms, but also the ideological bent of these social media platforms are such that they are promoting content that is not only about sex and, and male-female sex, kind of the, the normal thing, but violent, misogynistic, promoting transgender surgeries and hormones as if that's normal and, and a way towards uh, authenticity. And so it's coming at our kids and it's being normalized through social media. Uh, next, education. Every kid is in some kind of educational environment. And I have talked with families who have homeschooled their kids, who've had kids in Catholic schools, kids in public schools, and there's a vulnerability there no matter what the educational environment is. It depends on how well you're able to shape that environment. But I want to just say a quick word about the public schools. There's a problem top down and bottom up. And it's not that there aren't good teachers or good administrators or good families that are sending their kids there. It's that institutionally, we, are, we have an agenda, which is a different vision of the, whole, of the human person. It's an agenda which seeks to separate children from parents under the guise of, of children's autonomy, letting them decide who, something they can't decide who they are, but to reject their, their given sexual identity. And it is uh, really, really problematic. And the third that I think takes many parents by surprise is healthcare, even your own pediatrician. The American Academy of Pediatrics has completely backed the idea of what's called gender affirming care, which means a child says, I think I'm trans or non-binary or whatever it might be. The pediatrician is supposed to say, great, how can I support you? And wants to encourage parents along that vein. Worse, they are encouraged, the American Academy of Pediatrics encourages their physicians to talk to adolescents alone without the parents and to ask them probing questions. How do you feel about being a boy? How do you feel about being a girl? Who are you attracted to? Boys, girls, both, neither, something else? You know, they, so, so there's a propagandizing going on in the medical profession, but also in counseling. So parents have got to be vigilant to, to really ask hard questions. So I guess my, the way I'd sum it up is don't assume anything. You have to find your allies, and they are out there because the truth has its own appeal. But you have to be willing to ask hard questions and find out who is really going to support you, informing your children in the truth, and who is someone that, that you really should not be trusting your children with. Amen. And I, I appreciate your transparency and, and letting people know, letting parents know that you know, it, you can't always trust your healthcare provider when it comes to these things and that you've got to be able to do your own research and you've got to advocate for your children. And so speaking of advocating, Father, again, we're placing the emphasis on the human person when we're talking about these difficult issues with human sexuality. So can you explain the difference then 
between affirming disordered feelings or sinful behavior versus pastorally walking with others like your children? Well, you know, think of an example, you know, uh, I think you shared with me when we were visiting recently that, you know, you can be in, in, in a grocery store, in a, in a department store, just out in the public and walking around and with your own children and your children encounter someone who is presenting themselves as a female when they are, are biological male uh, or in reverse. And, you know, and so naturally children are curious and they're very observant. And, and so sometimes, you know, in those situations, you know, immediately a child wants to respond or ask a question. And of course, we, as, as we know, you always receive their questions and welcome their, their curiosity. But also it's important to help uh, our, our, our children, especially our adolescents and young adults, you know, start with the premise that we're talking about a, a person who has dignity, even when that person may not always understand their own inalienable dignity. We have to always see it, always acknowledge it, always uh, respect it, even when someone may be choosing a behavior that is contrary to that dignity. So I always advise parents, you know, always welcome the questions, but also help them in, to understand environment too, you know, not to make a public scene or make someone, make someone feel embarrassed or, you know, call someone a name or, or point your finger at them. And, you know, it's, it's because again, we're dealing with a person. And as has been said by, by Mary and Jason, people who don't always understand, they found themselves in, in this great difficulty or, you know, these doubts about their own sexuality and buying into the propaganda that's been, you know, so, so prominent in the culture. So really, it's about approachment. And then, as you know, it's important to do is when you get home or get in the car, is then talk about it. And I, I often, uh, when I was in parish ministry, I would encourage people, parents, to play like, you know, they could do with flashcards, you know, whether it be on uh, learning math or learning uh, spelling, is to do the same thing with Catholic teaching. You know, bring something to the children to help them understand, well, what does the church teach about what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God, and then ask them, what does that really mean? What does that really say about each person? And so even as we're confronting deviant behaviors or people who are struggling with different elements of the cross in daily life and circumstances, is how do then we approach with patience, with kindness, with uh, very much like the Good Samaritan. We, we kneel down and we tend to their need and at the same time, part of tending to that need is to also speak the truth. And, and that's where we have to teach our children not to be afraid of the truth. The truth is what unshackles us. It liberates us. It brings us authentic freedom. So, again, it's about forming our children with a mindset of approachment and respect, and also with that respect, bringing forth the truth that really helps all of us to flourish as we are meant to be. Amen. And, and that comes in the form of the observations that we make when, when we're out at the grocery store, also when our children come to us for things that they're struggling with. So, Father, just as a follow-up, what recommendations could you make for parents who have maybe a teenager who comes to them and confides in them that they're struggling with, you know, with that gender identity dysphoria, with uh, pornography, same-sex attraction, or any other issue um, or sinful behavior? If I could, I, I'd just like to reiterate what Jason said. I think it's a great approachment because it's being able to, to first of all, listen, you know, try not to answer their questions directly, you know, listen to what they're saying, at, and then maybe turn around that question and say, well, what do you think about that? Not so much for their sentiment or feeling, but talk to them. What, what, how would you approach your friend? What do you think would be good for your friend to hear? How would you approach this subject uh, if a, a fellow student in school said this or a teacher said that? You know, it's important, you know, to help our, our, our children understand and be comfortable in the articulation of a truth and, and to help them anchor that truth by giving them the resources they need to understand and be able to form a rational way of, 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 of approachment that they themselves can do. In other words, I don't want them repeating me. I don't want them to be a parent. What I want them to do is model what I have been able to show them as a parent, how I've directed them as a parent, how I've witnessed to them, but also then to help them help their own skills and their own abilities to come shining forth to help their friends or help others to understand what it means you know, to be truly an authentic uh, son and daughter of God. And Jason, you've done extensive research on these topics, and, and over the past several years, you have been completely immersed 
in this gender identity issue. So we're talking over 20,000 pages of research on ge not just gender theory, but also anthropology, endocrinology, psychology. You have done your work and you've summarized it in your book, Male, Female, Other, which we have at EWTNRC.com. So briefly, could you ex explain those findings and what do parents need to know about this issue? Well, I think a lot of parents who perhaps have a kid wrestling with them is told, well, if you don't affirm your kid in this, then you could contribute to their suicide. They're just going to take their life because of you. Uh, but what they found is if a kid does go through with these procedures, whether it's the puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, surgery, follow them about 10 years after the procedure, the suicide rate climbs to 19 times higher than the general population. If you isolate out the female to male transitioners, it's a suicide rate more than 40 times as high. And people will say, well, that's because of you transphobic bigots. Now, the real reason is that 90% of people who commit suicide, tragically, have a coexisting mental health issue. And Hormones and surgery are not the way to treat those things. In fact, the biggest gender clinic in the United Kingdom, which is recently thankfully shut down, did one audit of the incoming kids that were flooding into this gender clinic, and they kind of see where they were coming from. And what they found, 97.5% of these kids had coexisting mental health conditions and pre-existing trauma. 98% of these kids. And so we've got to look at the roots of where is all this stuff coming from? Sometimes it's a stereotype anxiety of like, wow, I don't feel like I fit into this narrow, rigid box of what a man is supposed to be. Maybe I'm just not one anymore. Or these girls who used to be considered tomboys, well, there's no room for that. You're, you're not a tomboy. You're either a guy or perhaps you're non-binary. And so you've got people falling into this category of what's known as rapid onset gender dysphoria, where they didn't have a pre-existing history of childhood gender dysphoria, and then it seemed to sprout up when they were 14, 15 years old, spending all this time on social media. For other kids, perhaps those who've been through trauma, especially the girls, what you'll find is they're, in a sense, disguising their sexual maturation as a protective mechanism from being over-sexualized by the culture. And because there's so many threads and roots behind this, I think it's important we listen to gender dysphoria with reverent curiosity, not for the sake of following it, whatever it leads and affirming the dysphoria, but there's, there's an unmet need, an ache there, and we need to listen, where's this coming from? Because if we simply slap the diagnosis of trans on these kids with the treatment pathway of transition, we're actually depriving these young people of the opportunity to develop strategies to address these legitimate issues in their life that need intervention. And so what the young people need to hear is that you were not born into the wrong body. You were born into the wrong culture, a culture that's telling you you have to hurt your body in order to be your authentic self. And so it's not your body that needs to be reconstructed. It's our culture that needs to be reconstructed. Amen. And in all of the research that you had done for your book, which again, we have at EWTNRC.com, it's called Male, Female, Other. Was there anything that surprised you about your research? You know, you've, you've been speaking about chastity and human sexuality for decades. What did you, what did you discover that surprised you? Well, one thing that didn't make it into the book that I just read recently in a book that I'm reading right now on the collapse of the Tavistock Gender Clinic over in the UK, one of the psychologists who used to work there, 35 of them quit, they said, we're not being allowed to explore these deeper issues, said that he had a patient group he was working with who was considering transitioning and another patient group he was working with who had already gone through the surgery. And he thought, well, what would happen if I put these two groups together so they could get to know each other and hear their different stories and gender journeys? You know what happened when they brought the two groups together? 98% of the kids who previously said they wanted to transition lost all interest in transitioning. They met these people who had been through that and realized, you know what? I think I can find other ways to deal with these deeper issues instead of creating new ones. And so I'm all in favor of giving the kids the information because they need to hear the truth. Because if we show them the truth, I think they'll realize the givenness of their sex is a gift. Even though it's a gift sometimes difficult to receive, that their bodies are good. And the solution isn't to change their body to conform to a stereotype, but maybe we need to revisit how rigid our stereotypes have become. And I'm so grateful for the work that Mary has done because she is 
telling these stories of, of people who are what's called detransitioners. So they had started the process of uh, transitioning or attempting to transition to another sex or another gender, and now they have started to try to undo that to the extent that they're able. So Mary, with all of the work that you've done with the Person and Identity Project, you have assembled a wealth of resources for parents to be able to address these issues head on. So when parents go to personandidentity.com and they start to gather all of this information, how does that translate to the conversations that they're having with their children? I think first of all, parents need to realize that this is affecting all of our kids. So it's, you can't wait to talk about this until a child says, I, I'm uncomfortable in my body, I think I'm born in the wrong body, or I identify as trans. You have to realize this is shaping how all of our young people understand who they are and what is normal, what is good, what is healthy for the human person. So you have to inform yourself, but then be willing to talk to your kids about it. Be proactive in giving them the truth. Be protective in telling them what the lies are and why those lies are wrong. And But before that, I loved Jason's formulation of you know asking questions. And, and what I would say is you have to uh, listen, ask, ask those questions, listen, and then be willing to guide. Empathize with the feelings, but then guide. And, th and then draw boundaries because our kids need to know that we love them enough that we're not going to support them going down a path that is going to lead towards harm. And so a couple of things I would just highlight, particularly for Catholics, because I often hear Catholics say, well, we have to do the compassionate thing. And so isn't it compassionate or respectful of the person to use pronouns or to support a child's attempt to do a social transition, change their name, their clothes, et cetera. And it's not. And here's why, because this pathway is a continuum. So when someone starts down the social transition path, they have taken on board this false belief that they can reject their given sexual identity and really become someone else. And it's just not true. But if the adults around them, their parents, their teachers, reaffirm that false belief, then really you are, you're pushing a kid down a path that's only going to lead towards harm. So when a kid's floundering, it's like they're in quicksand and you can't rescue someone in quicksand by meeting them where they are. You have to stand on the truth and you reach out and you pull them in and, and then you accompany. But, but you can't go into a, a, um, a, the quicksand and start to cooperate with the lie. They need to hear the truth. And, and then just a final stat on suicide. Again, just reiterating what Jason said, but there's another one parents should realize. There's uh, long-term studies that also have looked at suicidality at every stage of transition. And the average person who undergoes what they call a gender transition, in other words, they're rejecting their given sexual identity and, and they try to alter things. The average person who does commit suicide commit suicide six years into that process. So if transition were really the fix for those underlying wounds, you wouldn't see that. But transition, we have suicides happening at, at all different stages. So one of the things we've learned from detransitioners is that when you support someone in believing that lie, you're not only pushing them down a harmful path, you are getting them off the trajectory that might help them really begin to unpack those underlying wounds and get treatment, help for those underlying mental illness. That's, that's true compassion. So take the truth on board, love everyone, listen, ask questions, but don't be afraid to speak the truth with that conviction that, that there's no daylight between truth and charity. You know, what's good for the person, what's true is what ultimately we need to be leading others towards. Exactly. And Mary, in a conversation that you and I had previously, you mentioned that there is a silver lining in, in all of this being out in the open and that there's no room for the lies to hide anymore. It's all out there. And right. we know that we have truth, beauty and goodness on our side. And um, that's why we want to give parents the tools so they can be equipped to mm -hmm. to be proactive and also when, when our children are in the quicksand that we can rescue them. And Father, as parents start to become more proactive in learning about God's plan for humanity, we might come to realize some of the ways that we have struggled with sexual sin or confusion about sexuality, and that can be uncomfortable. Uh, so how can parents seek healing while also accompanying kids through their own struggles? Sure, and you know, uh, just a couple of ideas that uh, you know, I'd like to share. And, you know, first of all, it's just a story about a young father 
you know, with an adolescent, uh, many, a number of children, but one of his sons was in already past puberty and struggling uh, with his own uh, journey in, in this issue of chastity and purity. And, and his father in, uh, learned that the son was struggling with pornography. And so an example here was be the father came and said, Father, this is what I'm dealing with. You know, what would you advise? And the more that I listened, I realized that the father himself was struggling with something quite similar. And so we started by talking, where, where's his journey? You know, where are you in your faith journey? Where are you in this, this quest, you know, to live the life that Christ has called you to live as a son of God? And then how do you model that back towards your son, towards your children, towards your wife, to the people around you? And so uh, what I often try to do, and especially when I was in, 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 in a parish ministry, but now uh, in our work around the world, is how do we encourage support systems among families. You know, uh, we need mentorship. And one way to do that is to foster, you know, support, you know, from other families, to unite our families with other families who share our core values, who share our faith, you know, that we can talk to, where uh, men can talk to men, women can talk to women, and, and they can talk to each other, and where children can have other children model to them, you know, uh, you know, healthy life, and, and maybe also pose questions, you know, to their friends that they've, they're made here. And so the build that support system is so important in order to address some of these issues. And this is what the church itself encourages, you know, so that if I'm in an environment that's healthy, it doesn't mean everything is going to be perfect, doesn't mean there won't be those little moments and won't be those struggles, uh, you know. But what, what it does do, is it fosters a sense of companionship, of true accompaniment, that I'm not alone in this journey, that others are sharing in the same questions, the same, you know, desires, the same wants, and to find people who then can say, well, this is how I spoke to my son. This is how I address this with my daughter. This is how I spoke to my husband or to my wife about this situation. Or this is how we dealt with the school system. Or this is what we did when we learned that our child was being taught this in the school system. This is how we homeschool. In other words, su the support systems is a great way of approachment. And, and remember that parents are the primary educators of their children, which flows from their gift of welcoming their children, from the gift of procreation and the begetting of children. And to see that education is so important in what their children hear, what their children learn, who is influencing their children, uh, you know, what books are they reading, what's going on in the school library, what's happening, you know, with the TV that they may be watching or social media they may be engaged in. In other words, parents need to have an active, active role here not one on the sidelines, you know, this is a, a true engagement, being on the field with your children and being engaged in conversation with your children and take nothing for granted, Debbie, take nothing for granted. Because we do, we do have the truth, beauty and goodness on our, on our side. We do know that we have forces that are working against us to try to, to steal our children from us. But again, that we have the truth and that we as parents can, can show our children, we can model it for them and we can proclaim that truth in charity and with clarity. And um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. But if you appreciated the insight from our experts, be sure to share this episode with your friends. We'll have parts one and two available on our YouTube channel and also free to stream anytime at EWTN.com slash on demand. Jason Everett, Mary Rice Hassan, and Father Shannon Bouquet, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your light. And thank you for joining too. We do hope to see you right here next week on The Catholic Sphere.